Let's look at alkenes reacting with hydrogen halides. So all alkenes undergo addition reactions with hydrogen halides, and hydrogen ha halides are hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, and hydrogen iodide. Um, so here is a generic picture of what happens uh, when, in this case, um, ethene reacts with a hydrogen halide. X uh, is to represent the halide. So the hydrogen atom uh, will attach to the carbon, which is originally in the double bond, and the halogen atom to the other carbon, which was originally in the double bond. And the product is monosaturated, uh, meaning that there is a halogen, only one halogen attached, and saturated because there are no more double bonds. And in, in, in general, this is a halogen alkane. So let's look at addition uh, to symmetrical alkenes. The reaction usually happens uh, when the hydrogen halide is gaseous, and if also the alkene is um, a gas, then you can simply mix the two. However, if the alkene is liquid, you can bubble hydrogen halide through the liquid. But because water is present, remember that um, there will be a mixture of products, because the water will also get involved in the reaction. So here, for example, we have ethene reacting with hydrogen chloride, and the product is chloroethane. Um, so we're going from a unsaturated to a saturated um, molecule. And also look at butene um, with hydrogen chloride, and the product is 2-chlorobutane. Let's now look at the mechanism of electrophilic addition of hydrogen bromide in, in particular. So the mechanism shows um, the reaction in terms of the movement of the, of the electrons. So these curly arrows represent the movement of two electrons. And in alkenes, um, the double bond um, is a region of high electron density. And we've discussed this is because of the pi bond um, electrons. So it means that alkenes um, attract electrophiles and this is uh, in this double bond in particular. So let's look um, at the mechanism using the example of ethene reacting with hydrogen bromide to produce bromoethane. So hydrogen bromide is a polar molecule due to the more electronegative bromine and therefore it has um, a delta negative um, sign and the hydrogen is delta positive. And the hydrogen, because of the um, slightly positive charge, is attracted to the electron-rich double bond. So the pi electrons are also um, attracted to the delta H in the HBr. Um, and this causes the double bond to break and we represent the movement of the two electrons um, like this with this arrow and this shows that the double bond is breaking and at the same time a uh, bromide ion um, is also formed uh, shown here and this is known as the carbo carbocation because um, the carbon has a positive charge here I forgot to mention that the hydrogen, the HBr bond breaks heteroelectrically, meaning that two of the electrons um, go to the bromide to form a bromide ion. The next step is when the carbocation is, after it's formed, it is quite unstable. So quickly um, forms a bond with the bromide ion and we show the movement of the two electrons to form the new bond um, here. So we get bromoethane. You can see hydrogen and fluorine here, hydrogen and HCl, HBr and HI. So in the reaction with alkenes, the, um, the bond between the hydrogen and the halogen has to be broken first. So let's can look at uh, hydrogen fluoride. Mm, the bond is very strong. This is because fluorine is quite a small um, molecule. Therefore, it would, it's hard to break, um, so the reaction is very slow. And as we go down um, the halogen group, the size increases, and we can see that iodine is very large. Therefore, it would be uh, much easier to break this bond. Um, and this is a general trend that as you go down the group, 
um, the reactivity of the hydrogen um, halides increases. So how about um, reaction rates if we change the alkene? And again, the reaction rate will increase as the alkene gets more complicated. And by more complicated, I mean um, there are more alkyl groups added to the carbon atom in the double bond. So we can see here, I've got two methyl groups, and in this case, we've got four methyl groups. And as you go from this end to this end, um, the reactivity increases. And um, so let's discuss why this happens. Why, why is it that when... Um, alkenes get larger and more alkyl groups are present, why, why is the rate of the reaction um, also increased? So there are two reasons. The first reason is that alkenes um, react because the electrons in the pi bond attract a positive charge. So the, um, the alkyl groups, um, for example here, will push the electrons away from themselves towards a double bond. And therefore, the more alkyl groups you have, the more negative um, the area around the double bond becomes because of this pushing effect. So the more negatively charged the region becomes, the more it will um, attract molecules like hydrogen chloride, which are electrophiles, meaning that um, they are attracted to regions of uh, negative charge. So this is the first reason why uh, reactivity increases as alkenes become more complicated. Let's look at the second reason. And the second reason um, is to do with the stability of the intermediate ion. So as mentioned previously, we, uh, we've got a carb carbocation forming. And the stability of this ion will govern the rate of the reaction. So as you increase the complexity of the alkene, the activation energy falls, which makes um, the reaction faster. So here, in this um, diagram here, we have a primary carbocation, then we have a secondary and a tertiary. So as the ion gets more energetically stable, um, it becomes easier to form. So let's just review what a carbocation is. Um, a carbocation is just um, when carbon has a positive charge. Um, a primary carbocation is when the positive carbon is attached to one alkyl group, like here, we have only one methyl group. In a secondary carbocation, uh, the positive carbon is attached to two alkyl groups. In a tertiary um, carbocation is when you have three alkyl groups, so we have one, two, and three. And we can see that the electron pushing effect of the methyl groups is placing more and more negative charge on the positive carbon as you go from primary to secondary to tertiary carbocations. So the effect of this, of course, is to cut down that positive charge. At the same time, the region around the various methyl groups is becoming some, somewhat positive. So the net effect then is that the positive charge um, is being spread out over more and more atoms as you go from primary to secondary to tertiary ions. Uh, so the more you can spread the charge around, the more stable the ion becomes. Therefore, the order of stability, we can see that a tertiary is um, more stable than a secondary, and a secondary is more stable than a primary. So that's another reason why, as you get larger alkenes, the rate of the reaction increases. Up to this point we've considered symmetrical alkenes, um, but let's now consider the addition of hydrogen halides to unsymmetrical alkenes. Um, the reaction conditions and the factors that affect the rate of the reaction are the same as for symmetrical alkenes, but the main question is um, where does the hydrogen and the halogen attach to which carbon? So let's take the example um, of hydrogen chloride reacting with propene. So here is a molecule of propene and hydrogen chloride um, reacting, and there are two possible products. So how do we know which one would be the major and which one would, would be the minor product? Um, there is a rule that we can use to decide, and um, this rule is called Markovnikov's rule. And the rule states that uh, when an unsymmetrical alkene reacts with a hydrogen halide, 
the hydrogen adds to the carbon of the alkene that has the greater number of hydrogen substituents. So we can see this hydrogen here and we can see the two carbons here. So in, in this carbon there's only one hydrogen and this has two hydrogens. Therefore the hydrogen will attach itself onto this carbon like here because it has more hydrogen substituents. And also according to the rule um, the halogen will attach to the carbon of the alkene with the fewer number of hydrogen substituents. So this uh, chlorine here will attach itself to this carbon because it has only one. Therefore the major product would be 2 chloropropane. However there is a possibility of um, one chloropropane forming as well. Um, but if we apply the Markovnikov's rule we know um, what the major product should be. So let's look at propene and hydrogen bromide. So in this reaction um, the hydrogen and the halogen could add either way across the double bond. So this would give a mixture of products um, and both would be halogenoalkanes. At first it would appear that both would be equally as likely, however one is more likely to be formed than the other and this again goes back to uh, Markovnikov's rule. So we can see um, hydrogen bromide. So the hydrogen would prefer to attach itself to the carbon that has more hydrogens on it already, therefore this carbon here and the bromine uh, would attach itself to the carbon that has um, only one hydrogen here, therefore the major product would be two bromopropane and one bromopropane would be the minor product. However, hydrogen bromide reacting with propene is a special case because hydrogen bromide can add across the carbon-carbon double bond either way depending on the conditions. So if both hydrogen bromide and the alkene are totally pure, uh, the addition will happen in line with Markovnikov's rule, meaning that the major product would be 2-bromopropane. However, if the hydrogen bromide and the alkene contains traces of organic peroxides, so for example, if oxygen from the air is present, um, the alkene will slowly react with the oxygen to give um, organic peroxides. So in this case, the addition will happen um, as an anti-Markovnikov addition, and this is also sometimes referred to as the peroxide effect. So we can see here that uh, we have propene reacting with hydrogen bromide, but because we've got either organic peroxides or oxygen from the air, uh, the major product would be one bromopropane. And this is obviously anti-Markovnikov, because if it was a Markovnikov reaction, um, then the major product would be two bromopropane. So let's look at oxidation of the carbon-carbon double bond by potassium manganate uh, to produce a diol. So the condition for this reaction are um, that it's cold and there will be a color change, uh, but the color change depends on whether the potassium manganate 7 is in acidic or in alkaline conditions. So if it's acidified, uh, the solution will turn from purple to colorless. And if the reaction is happening in alkaline conditions, uh, the purple color will first go to dark green and then um, a, dark, a dark brown precipitate uh, will form. And this is sometimes used um, to test for the carbon-carbon double bond. We have ethene reacting with, we represent the oxidizing agent as the O in the square brackets in water to produce a diol. And a diol is when you have two OH groups attached, so it's uh, an alcohol. Because the manganate ions are a strong oxidizing agent, um, they will oxidize um, the ethene to ethane-1,2-diol. And this product here um, has many uses. Um, for example, it's often used as antifreeze, it's also used in polyesters and plasticizers, and plasticizers add uh, flexibility to plastic. 
let's let's first consider acidic conditions. Um, in acidic conditions, uh, the manganate seven ions uh, will be reduced to manganese two, and <clears throat> we can see that this is a reduction if we assign oxidation numbers. So in this case, um, the overall charge here is minus one. Oxygen has the oxidation number of minus eight. It's generally minus two because of four here, it becomes minus eight. So therefore the oxidation number for um, manganese is plus seven. And this produces the overall charge of minus one. And if we look at the product, um, <clears throat> it, the charge on the manganese is now plus 2. Therefore, it has undergone reduction because it's gained 5 electrons. So it's gone from plus 7 to plus 2. Let's consider uh, if this reaction uh, happens in alkaline conditions. Um, in alkaline conditions, um, the manganate 7 ions are first reduced to green uh, manganate 6 ions. Uh, so again, um, we can see that this is a reduction because in this case um, we uh, the oxidation number for manganese is plus 7 and it goes to plus 6, therefore it's been reduced. And this, this is the first stage where the dark green solution forms. And then further, um, it goes to dark brown and the dark brown solid is the manganese oxide as shown here. Let's consider the hydration of alkenes. And this is how we produce alcohols by direct hydration of alkenes. And hydration meaning that we add water directly to the carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, so to produce e ethanol uh, we would react ethene with steam and we would also use a catalyst um, and this is often referred to as a acid catalyzed hydration. So as we as we can see here, we have ethene in as as a gas reacting with H two O gas, meaning it's steam to produce ethanol. And this reaction is reversible. So when this reaction happens, only five percent of the ethene is converted into ethanol at each pass through the reactor. So by removing the ethanol from the equilibrium mixture and recycling the ethene, it is possible to achieve an overall 95% conversion. So we can see here, if we use one part of ethene plus 0.6 um, parts of steam, under these conditions, um, and when the gases are cooled, um, an ethanol turns to liquid, then we have ethanol. However, anything that's unreacted, we simply return it back, and that's when we, we can get, uh, get up to 95 um, conversion from ethene to ethanol. So let's now consider what uh, happens when ethene reacts with oxygen, um, and the product is epoxyethane. The conditions for this reaction are that the temperature should be around 280 degrees centigrade, the pressure should be about 15 atmospheres, and we use silver as the catalyst to produce epoxyethane. Epoxyethane, as we can see, is um, cyclic, um, and it's a cyclic ether because it contains a ring. We will consider ethers um, in a further video. Epoxyethane is very reactive, and this is because um, the bonding pairs in the ring of atoms in the molecule are forced very close together. So the bond angles um, are about 60 degrees rather than 109.5 when carbon atoms normally form single bonds. And also, the overlap between the atomic orbitals uh, in forming the carbon-carbon and carbon-oxygen bonds is less good than it is normally, and there is considerable repulsion between the bonding pairs. Therefore, uh, this, the system becomes more stable if the ring is broken. So, let's consider the uses uh, of, of epoxyethane. Uh, and specifically, um, this reaction here, which produces... Um, ethane-1,2-diol, 
Um, this reaction is called um, an acid catalyzed hydrolysis. Um, and this is when epoxy ethane reacts with water in the presence of an acid catalyst, usually a very dilute sulfuric acid at room temperature. And the product is ethane 1 2 diol. And ethane 1 2 diol has, is used as antifreeze and car engines. And um, it is also added to the cooling water to prevent it from freezing under very um, cold conditions. And it's also used uh, in cold climates like in, in countries like Russia and Canada to spray, uh, spray planes before takeoff. Let's now consider the reaction of epoxy ethane with alcohols. Alcohols have a formula of ROH where R can be an alkyl group and water can be thought of as um, HOH. So the reaction of epoxy ethane with water can be color coded like this and we can do the same thing with the alcohol. The important thing to notice here um, when the epoxy ethane reacts with an alcohol um, that the product is still an alcohol. It has an OH group um, at this end of the molecule. Uh, and this product here is uh, referred to as alkoxy alcohol. So since the product is still an alcohol, if um, we add um, epoxy ethane in excess, uh, the reaction can continue, um, like here. And again, um, the product of the reaction is an alcohol. And this can go on um, to react with even more epoxy ethane. So what we get finally is a chain with a structure that looks like this. Um, and these are quite useful and they are often used as plasticizers. So you add them, to, ex for example, to PVC to make it more flexible. Or you can also use it as a non-ionic detergent. Let's now consider polymerization of alkenes. Uh, the majority of alkenes are used in the polymer industry to form plastics. So the key terms we need to know are um, monomer. Uh, so a monomer is a small unit uh, which combines with other monomers to form a polymer. A polymer is a long molecular chain built up from uh, monomer units. And addition polymerization is a process in which unsaturated alkene molecules monomers, add to a growing polymer chain one at a time uh, to form a very long saturated molecular chain, which is referred to as uh, the addition polymer. So for example, ethene uh, here, you, we can see that it, because they're small individual units, we refer to them as ethene monomers. And when they undergo polymerization, um, they become polyethene. And this is just to show the common equation. So again, a monomer can be any alkene. <coughs> um, y, W, X and Z could be either, let's say, chlorine or fluorine. We'll see these later. Or it can be a methyl group. And under, uh, after polymerization, we represent it in these square brackets. Um, and again, to show the N number, to show how many of these monomers there are in the polymer. So let's look at polyethene. And polyethene comes in two varieties. Uh, one is the low density polyethene and the other one is high density polyethene. So let's consider the lo low density polyethene first. So the conditions um, in order to produce this low density polyethene are you need a temperature of about 200 degrees centigrade, the pressure of about 2000 atmospheres and the initiator is a small amount of oxygen. For the high density polyethene, uh, the temperature is much lower of only about 60 degrees centigrade. Again, the pressure is also very low. And in this case, we use a catalyst called um, Zieglenata, which is a mix of titanium compounds and aluminium compounds. So there are quite extensive differences in the properties. So let's consider low density polyethene first. Um, this type of polyethene has many branches on the hydrocarbon chain, so the chains um, can't lie close to each other. And the chains are held together by van der Waals uh, dispersion forces. 
So this is um, what a low-density polyethene would look like. You can see that there is a random arrangement of chains. And this random arrangement of chains is known as the amorphous region. And so the more of these um, you have, the slower is the effectiveness of the van der Waal of um, the van der Waals forces, which means um, that low density polyethenes have a lower boiling point. Um, there are some regions of crystalline uh, where the chains lie close and regularly packed together. Um, but in low density polyethene, you mostly have um, chains that are randomly positioned. So let's compare the properties to high density polyethene. In high density polyethene, there is little branching, unlike here. And about 95% um, is crystalline, meaning that the chains are arranged um, close together and they can uh, pack quite close together and this in turn increases the van der Waals forces between the chains meaning that high density polyethene is stronger and it has a higher boi boiling point than lower density polyethene. The uses are um, also quite different so the uses of low density polyethene are for plastic carrier bags and for other low strength and flexible flexible sheet materials, whereas high density polyethene is used um, for milk bottles and plastic pipes because it is um, quite a bit stronger than low density polyethene. So let's now look at polypropene. This is what propene looks like, um, but it's easier to imagine um, propene represented as such to show that the methyl group is at the top because when you add them all together to produce polypropene it's easier to um, understand whether how they are arranged so this is the formula for a propene for a propene monomer and this is what a propene um, polymer would look like so just bear in mind that these diagrams here are in 2D but in reality Obviously, they are 3D. So, because of because of the three-dimensional nature of molecules, um, in this case, there are three different types of polypropene, uh, and it and this depends on where the methyl group is. And the three um, different types are: it can either be isotactic, it can be a tactic, or syndiotactic. So let's consider these in more detail. Here we have an isotactic polypropene represented here and we can see that all of the methyl groups have the same orientation along the chain. So there is a regular arrangement of the methyls of the methyl groups so they can pack close together um, therefore the van der Waals forces will be greater and which makes them quite strong, so they are often used in ropes and plastic crates. Uh, just a reminder, um, if you if you aren't aware of what these dotted lines and the wedge means, the dotted line represents uh, a bond going back into the screen, and the wedge um, shows that this methyl group is coming out towards us. So we can see that every other um, propene monomer uh, the methyl group is coming out towards us and the hydrogen is going back into the screen so the hydrogen is behind. So this is what um, an isotactic polypropene looks like. Uh, the other type is called atactic polypropene and this is when the methyl groups are randomly arranged and there is no regularity. So if we look here we can see that in this case, um, and in this case, um, both of the methyl groups are coming out towards us, whereas in this case, the methyl group is going towards the back and the hydrogen is coming towards us. And here again, the methyl group is coming out towards us and the hydrogen is going into the screen. So because of this irregularity, uh, there are we weaker van der Waals forces so, and the use of this polypropene is for road paint and roofing felt. And the last type is syndiotactic 
polypropene. And this is when every other methyl group is oriented in the same way. So we can see that in this case, the methyl group is coming out towards us. Here, the methyl group is going back into the, into the page. Here it's coming out again, here it's going back. So this degree of, this small degree of re regularity uh, means that the van der Waals interactions are relatively strong and um, this type of polypropene is used in packaging of food and also for medical tubes and bagging. Let's consider polychloroethene, also known as PVC, and um, PVC is, is short for polyvinyl chloride, and this is the old naming. So the monomer is chloroethene, as shown here, and this is what um, the polymer would look like. So polymerization of chloroethene produces an atactic polymer. Atactic PVC means that the chlorine atoms have um, random orientations along the chain. So um, they stick out randomly. And because they're also quite large in size, the chlorines, um, the chains um, can't lie close together. Um, therefore, polychloroethene is mostly um, amorphous um, and it's got very small areas of crystallinity. So generally, when we have this random arrangement of chains, um, it means that the polymer is more flexible than, let's say, crystalline um, polymer because the forces of attraction between the chains are weaker. However, in the case of polychloroethene, um, it is not flexible at all, actually. It's rigid. Um, and it's rigid because there are additional dipole-dipole interactions uh, due to the hydrogen and chlorine bond being quite polar. Because chlorine is very electronegative and it's more electronegative than carbon, so the electrons in the bond are more attracted to the chlorine. So the chlorine becomes um, slightly negative or delta negative and the carbon slightly positive. So in order to overcome this, we add plasticizers um, and plasticizers um, reduce the effectiveness of these attractions and it also makes um, the plastic more flexible. So PVC is used mostly in plastic windows, guttering, electrical cable insulation, footwear, clothes, and so on. So let's now look at polytetrafluoroethene, also known as Teflon. Like polyethene, except um, that all the hydrogen atoms are replaced by fluorine atoms. So as shown here, the fluorines are in green. So it's like polyethene, except that instead of the hydrogens, we have the fluorines. Um, as we can see here, the polymer is fairly crystalline. And in this case, there are no additional dipole to dipole interactions um, because the chain, in addition to the dispersion forces, unlike PVC. So in, PV in the previous slide, we saw that because chlorine uh, is quite large, we have to um, add plasticizers, but in this case we don't because the fluorine atoms are arranged regularly around the carbon backbone. Uh, each bond is very polar, but the overall um, effect is that they cancel each other out, unlike with um, PVC. So the properties are um, that Teflon has a relatively high melting point due to the strength um, of attraction between the chains and it's also very resistant to chemical attack. Um, as we can see here, the carbon chain is wrapped up in the fluorine atoms, um, so nothing can really get to the carbon to attack to um, react with it. And um, polytetrafluoroethenes are used in chemical and food industries to uh, to coat vessels to make them resistant to corrosion and they're also used in non-stick kitchen utensils. Let's look at polymer waste. So polymers and waste from polymers represents about 10% of municipal waste but the problem is that most polymers are not biodegradable and when we say that something is not biodegradable it means that the material cannot be broken down naturally in the presence of living organisms so therefore it goes into the landfill and 
landfill space will run out in the UK in the next 10 years if alternative methods are not found. So what are the alternative methods to deal with polymer waste? Well, we can burn it and burning polymers releases just about the same amount of energy that it takes to make them. So, and, th and this reduces the use of fossil fuels. Also, modern technology um, has made it possible that when we burn polymers, um, this is slightly cleaner than uh, traditional power stations. And other um, gases like hydrogen chloride from PVC can be removed using gas scrubbers and um, the gases are removed by neutralization with a spray of alkali. Also, um, we can use recycling. So recycling is the process of recovering waste plastic and reprocessing the material into useful products, sometimes completely different um, from the original state. So for example, we can go from a soft drinks bottle becoming a plastic chair. There is one problem, however, and the problem is that plastic polymers require greater processing. So you need to do heat treating, thermal depolymerization and monomer recycling uh, in order for these polymers to be recycled, recycled uh, as compared to glass or metal. Uh, so the process of recycling is that first of all, um, the plastics have to be sorted according to their resin type and we use a plastic identification code as shown here. You can see that um, most plastic bottles will have um, this code so they can be easily sorted and also um, we sort them by color. Then um, the plastic recyclables are then shredded and undergo a process to eliminate impurities, for example paper labels. And finally um, it is melted and often extruded, and extruded means that you're creating um, objects that have the same size, so they are shaped into pellets, like shown here, which can then be sold and used to manufacture other products.